All right, welcome to Faces and Places in Fashion. Um, I know we have a lot of visitors today, so welcome to those of you who are not uh, part of the class. I know we have some visitors from other schools and also our alumni, so welcome back to FIT. It's always great to have our alumni here. As a reminder, we do have a, an alumni-supported uh, event right after this class that includes a lot of uh, great tasty foods, so everyone is very welcome. Uh, I would just ask that after the class that uh, you just come down this way or this way and loop around the back and uh, the food and networking will take place back there. So. Uh, everyone's very welcome and it's a great chance to uh, meet the speaker and, and kind of uh, have a chance to uh, meet everyone here in the room and uh, also get a little food, right? Uh, one quick or two quick announcements related to the class. The first one is, is that uh, thank you for all of those who've been turning in papers. Um, I don't have any papers to return back today, uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'll grade them on a rolling basis. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, we've had a change to our schedule. I mentioned this at the beginning that sometimes this happens uh, due to a, another uh, thing that's come up. A MAC Cosmetics isn't going to be here on April 6th. Uh, so it's sad that they won't be able to be here, but the good news is, is that it allows for our first speaker, who was canceled due to the snowstorm, to be able to be with us, the CEO uh, of Ashley Stewart, and so he's very excited that he got a second chance to come back and speak to you. Oops, I hit a button there, I apologize. <laughs> so I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our guest speaker today, Sarah Hall. Sarah is the president of Sarah Hall Productions Incorporated, an award-winning, full-service boutique public relations firm that specializes in entertainment and lifestyle accounts based here in New York City. Uh, she's known for her unswerving dedication to her clients and her meticulous attention to detail. She represents up to 30 high-profile clients uh, in the entertainment and lifestyle categories in the United States and in Great Britain, and is a true standout in her field. She also happens to be an alumni of the Fashion Institute of Technology, so it's always wonderful to have people come back and to be able to bring their expertise with them. Um, as per usual, we'll have our presentation uh, followed by Q&A. Uh, today's event is being recorded so that we ask if anyone wants to ask a question that you either go to one of the two mics that are available or wait for a mic to be given to you. That way it can be recorded uh, so that everyone can... Oh, I keep doing that. I apologize. <laughs> uh, so if, if you do want to question, ask a question, just make sure that you wait for the mic so that everyone can hear you. Uh, so it's uh, without further ado, and my great pleasure to introduce Sarah Hall. Welcome. So my phone rings, and it's my friend Pat. And she and I used to work together when we traveled the world with an international pop star. And she was his backup singer, and I was his tour assistant. And the one thing that I remember about being on the road with her was that she was always saying, you have to meet my younger brother. You guys would get along so great. You have the same sense of humor. You'd be terrific friends. And as much as I wanted to meet him, we were never all in the same city at the same time. So sadly, that never happened. But on this call, they were coming to New York. And it was very exciting because they were having dinner and they invited me. So we went out to dinner and had an amazing time, told stories about the road, talked about what we're doing now. And at the end of the dinner, her brother approached me and said, I'd really like to hire you as my publicist and have you take my career to the next level. And I said, that would be amazing. I would like to do that. And we're still working together today, 16 years later. And that is the story of how my friend, Pat Hawk, introduced me to her little brother, Tony. And you guys may know him better as Tony Hawk, international skate legend. And I was really excited to represent him because I knew that he was very known in the Southern California thrasher scene. But I knew that there was going to be a bigger audience, mainstream, if I could only get the opportunity to do that. And so today, years later, we're actually very known for our ability to cross a client over from one niche area into a more mainstream area. So Tony was one of my first clients at SHP. So let me tell you a little bit about SHP. We are an award-winning boutique PR firm, and we specialize in lifestyle and entertainment accounts. And by lifestyle and entertainment, I would say that lifestyle is anything that brushes up against somebody's day-to-day. 
um, we, as personal publicists, specialize in creating a very couture and bespoke campaign for all of our clients. One of the things I think separates us from other agencies is that we are a phone pitch agency, which means we are on the phone calling editors and producers every day from 10 to 12 and from 2 to 5. And the good news about this is it's much easier to influence someone's decision when you have them on the phone. And I know a lot of PR firms, when you walk in, you might just hear the clicking of a keypad, but at our office, you will hear people hustling on the phone, getting feedback, calling clients, and it really is integral to how many bookings we get. In all of our industries, it's very important for us to stay on top of trends and evolutions. And I think as early as four years ago, we were telling our clients, you must start to develop your social media platforms. And today, we have so many social media platforms at our agency, we actually have a social media director who runs all of those campaigns. Another new trend that I would highlight is that producers now want to know your social media numbers for a client before they'll even consider having you on the show. That was never the case before, but it certainly is the case now. And so with our philosophy in place and our dedication to our clients, I was able to grow the agency from three clients early on to 30 at any one given point in time currently with an amazing staff who's all here today and incredible interns. And I want to mention that some of my former interns, as well as some of my current interns, are here today. I want to give uh, two particular shout outs. One is to Dana Hayward, who I believe, hello, Dana, is right there. Dana came and was a summer intern for us a few summers ago. And she had such an incredible eye for graphics that I had to hire her uh, to do our social media. So if you come and follow us on any of our threads, a lot of that is Dana's vision. And then I believe Justin is sitting next to you. And Justin also we adore. And we met Justin through FIT Shadow Program. And he came to work in our office for the day. And then we wouldn't let him leave. And so he works with us whenever we can grab him uh, in between classes. So this year, we're very proud to be celebrating our 20th anniversary over at SHP. And um, I've told you a little bit about some of our long-term clients. I want to share some of the current clients that we have. We represent authors like Jane Green, 16-time New York Times bestselling author. We also work with Hay House on some of their leading authors, such as Spirit Junkie, Gabrielle Bernstein, and Mastin Kip. We also represent Kelly Clark, four-time Olympian, who is actually the highest decorated, most decorated snowboarder, male or female. And um, she's wonderful to work with. We represent Barbara Butler and her play structures. Just have to say something. They start at $3,000 for cottages, and they go upwards of $350,000. Some of them have hot and cold running water. They're amazing. Uh, we also represent Your Power Tech Gloves, which I think some of you got today. And we represent an amazing juice company called Pressed Juicery, and they have a book of recipes. We also represent Lisa Evans, who's a Hollywood costume designer. In addition to Lisa's private celebrity clientele, she also does all of the Judd Apatow films. And she has a new film coming out in July with Amy Schumer called Trainwreck. And she's also currently in Milan with Ben Stiller, where she's working on Zoolander 2. So now that you know a little bit about some of the clients that we represent, I wanted to share with you a couple of my favorite points about how we brand them. In building a brand, we feel that if you are on target with your press, you will build a brand by default. And what I mean by that is we work with Tito's Handmade Vodka, and we work very closely with Tito to make sure that we are hitting all of his targets. So that could be the New York Times business story, that could be the men's publications, that could be the food and beverage outlets, or even the cocktail page in the women's publications. Point two, see the client with completely fresh eyes. See them in a way that no one else thought to at all stages of their career. Now, this is probably something that most agencies don't participate in because it might be the hardest, but I also really love it the most because it's the most creative. So a couple of examples of this would be, we have an international best-selling author named Robert Greene. 
And instead of pitching him for the book review, I think he has a fascinating life. He's a strategist. So people like Kanye, 50 Cent, and Jay-Z, they won't make a move without checking with Robert Greene first. And I thought that was really the story, not so much the book, although it is, but it's really him. And so I pitched A Day in the Life story, and that turned into a nine-page feature. Also, Paramount called to buy the rights to the book after that story came out. Then House and Garden with Tony ollieing over a pink Bentley. We had just been hired by Activision to promote his video game. And I know that all the moms in the house have the buying power. So that was a very strategic move and decision to put him there. And then Gabby, Gabrielle Bernstein, instead of pitching her for a book review, uh, Kelly Wolf in our office pitched her as a guest blogger where she could answer questions. And she also went on to go and give her uplifting, mood-boosting playlist. And that, again, was much more strategic and had a much bigger impact than just a simple book review. A client's brand will grow much faster with a talent agent attached. Now, this particular point is not mandatory, but I happen to be of the school of feeling that agents and publicists can accomplish a lot together. And an example of that would be Tony's brand. So in addition to our press, which you could see, which is everything from the magazine standpoint, which we're also looking at up here are action figures, books, clothing lines, gear, and video games. And having that all come together is really what builds the brand and makes it a very sort of 360 degree vision. It's incredibly rewarding for the client, and the only person happier than them is really us, because we know what went into it to do it. So I think at this stage, the real question is, how did I get to the point where I have a career that I love, clients that I adore, and an amazing staff? And I think that for me, personally, everything started for me here at FIT. FIT was an incredible place for me because it really helped to develop me, to get me to where I am today. In a particular couple of ways, one, the obvious most important one, it taught me a lot about fashion and showed me that this can be used as really a creative art form to express yourself. Another thing was there was an incredible amount of personalities when I was going to school here, and that has really stayed with me in terms of how to manage different people, because everybody needs to be managed differently, and that's something that really stuck with me as well. Um, another thing that it had given me as well is an aesthetic. It's an aesthetic that was for me personally, but I've also been able to bring it into my workplace and also use that for clients. A couple of other little facts about FIT. I lived in the dorms, in both dorms, which were the greatest two years of my life. And I also switched my major twice, which I was, at the time, very, very embarrassed about because I thought you should really know what you wanted to do with the rest of your life at 18 or 19 years old. And so I came in in fine arts, and I switched out of that when I realized I would not make a living painting fruit. And then I went from fine arts into advertising design, which I loved, but it was very mechanical and mathematical. And that didn't work for me. So I switched from ad design into communications, and that's where I really found my home. Um, I did want to share also, when I was a student at FIT, I had a very intense relationship with the Career Placement Board, because this is where you found all of the incredible jobs and internships. And when I was an intern at my favorite internship, which made videos for MTV, they actually offered me a job when I graduated. They were gonna groom me to be a producer. And I'm like, okay, that's it, my life is set. I'm gonna be a producer, thank you FIT, everything's good. And a week before graduation, they came to me and said that they were having budget cutbacks. They had to let go six producers that I was actually very friendly with, and they would not be able to hire me. And I was devastated because I thought that I would never find my dream job. And it was really upsetting. And I had this moment where I realized, instead of going home and crying about it, I walked into the office of the president of the company. And I said, John, I have to tell you something. My friends have been sending out resumes for about six months, and I have not sent out 
not one, because I was set to work here. I really need your help. Can you help me? And he was very sympathetic, and he said, come back tomorrow. I want to think about this. So I went back the next day, and he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. On Monday, you start work at Ford Models. And I was blown away, because you guys have to understand, for decades and decades and decades, Ford Models has been the number one modeling agency in the entire world. So this exceeded any kind of help that I thought John would be able to give me. But unbeknownst to me, he was married to a Ford. So I learned a couple of lessons early on there that I want to share with you guys. One is, if you ever need help, ask. Don't waste time thinking about if you should ask. If you need help, ask. Two, go to the decision maker. Do not waste your time with mid-level people or low-ranking people. Find the decision maker and go right to them. And the third thing I want you to know is that if you are sincere and nice and a hardworking person, people are more than willing to help you. They really do want to help you. So I started work at Ford Models. I landed up staying there for seven and a half years. I worked in the promotion department where we took new faces. I put two up here that I worked with very closely when I was at Ford. Uh, Jennifer Connolly on the left and Christy Turlington on the right and tried to show you the evolution of what we would do with them. We would take them from new teen models and turn them into and transition them into cover girls. And even after a model's career, they can also go on to do wonderful things. Jennifer, as you see here, is holding her Oscar. She went to Yale and was also named Amnesty International's Human Rights Educator by Amnesty International. And um, Christy Turlington started a company you may know called Every Mother Counts. It's a nonprofit that's dedicated to making childhood safe for every mother. So after I left Ford seven and a half years, I landed up going to the William Morris Agency. A friend introduced me to the head of the music department, and here was the deal. It was a tough, tough gig. Impossible boss and grueling hours. And even with that, I felt, and that's a lesson I would share with you guys too, even with a really, really tough boss and really impossible hours, I felt there'd be a reward in taking a job like this in terms of the access that I would have, the networking I would have, and I felt that I would be rewarded. And for me personally, I was, because that's where I met my husband. <laughs> and I think any job you meet your husband at is a great job, <laughs> which I would share with all of you. So here I am, I have a great guy, I have a great apartment, I have a great job, and what do I do? I leave. I had an opportunity that was a very rare opportunity to go and travel with this international pop star. And I've signed too many confidentiality agreements, so don't even ask who it was, because I can't talk. But I go on the road with him, and that was a great opportunity for me, because I feel that when things are that rare, opportunity seldom knocks twice. So you really have to assess if it's worth giving up all the great things that you have, because I think a lot of people in life say, well, I'll get the next one. Well, sometimes they don't come around again. So it's personal, and you have to assess if you think it's worth leaving for or not. I was happy that I did, because this was the job that I landed up meeting Pat Hawk at, and that's how I met Tony Hawk. And so for me, it all came full circle. Now I just want to share with you my five tips that I live by. One, talk to people. I really do feel that with all the portals of communication available to everybody, people communicate less now than ever before. So it doesn't matter if you have 5,000 friends on Facebook or you could text wicked fast. If you can't look someone in the eye and maintain engaging conversation with them, you're not communicating. So you have to really consider what that is. And also, it is in the art of conversation that there really is chemistry and sometimes magic that can happen. So you have to give that a chance to occur. And that's only going to come across through conversing. Um, one last thing about that. Maya Angelou has an amazing quote where she says, people will forget what you said, and people will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And I feel there's a real opportunity to make people feel special and to engage with them 
through the art of conversation. So just keep that in mind. Be spiritually rerouted. And by this, I mean, sometimes doors are closed for a reason, and you just may not know what that reason is. So don't be too resistant to it. I think everybody probably has a really good idea of where they want to go once they leave school, but odds are it's going to roll out differently for you than you might think it will. And sort of similar to my story and thinking I was going to be a TV producer, and I was so excited about it, and then I ended up getting a job that was sort of adjacent to that category. Sometimes being spiritually rerouted is a fantastic thing. You just have to be aware of it. So if a door closes, again, don't be too resistant to it, but maybe look for the other door that's opening somewhere else and see if that's more suited for you. Be royal in your fashion. The client that I mentioned before, Robert Greene, the international best-selling author um, who works with Kanye and Jay-Z, he has a book called The 48 Laws of Power, and I just wanted to read this to you for a moment. Law number 34, be royal in your own fashion. Act like a king to be treated like one. The way you carry yourself will often determine how you are treated. In the long run, appearing vulgar or common will make people disrespect you. For a king respects himself and inspires the same sentiment in others. By acting regally and confident of your powers, you make yourself seem destined to wear a crown. If you want to rule the world, tuck in your shirt. That's how it's done. And four, you become what you believe. I hope that everybody in this room is sort of coming from the same school of thought that I am, in that your thoughts completely create your reality. And once you kind of get on board with that and you know that, the trick is you have to be really responsible with your thoughts. As a matter of fact, the full expression here is you will not become what you want. You will become what you believe. So if you are not the kind of person who visualizes, I, I want to suggest maybe you start to visualize, maybe you start to make a list of the people, places, and things that you would like to have in your life, and perhaps even consider cutting pictures out in magazines and putting them up on a vision board. It's a great way to get things from being just a wish and turning them into a goal. And then my fifth and final is, if you don't build your dream, someone else will hire you to build theirs. And that is truly how the world works. So keep that in mind. Um, I would like to offer you guys another opportunity to get a glimpse into our world and what we do over at SHP. And so if you have the opportunity to follow us on Facebook and on Instagram, as well as Twitter, please do, because I think it'll give you a real behind the scenes look at what goes on inside a PR firm. And then before I open up the Q&A, which we're gonna do right now, um, I just wanted to also say thank you to Miriam Smith, the alumni manager from Alumni Engagement for inviting us here today, thank you. As well as Graham Stevens, Andrew Cronin, of course, Professor Williams, and family and friends, and a big thank you to my assistant, Carolyn, who pulled all of this together, and my staff who came in and handed out bags. So thank you for all this, and now we can open up the Q&A. Thank you. A little hard to see. You should just leave that in my wedding picture right there. <laughs> Are we passing a mic around? Okay. Hi, Sarah. I just want to ask, who is your favorite fashion designer, and what did you learn about fashion while you were here at FIT? That's a great question. I learned a lot about fashion when I was here at FIT. One of the things that I remember most was a class really was about the construction of clothing. And I still to this day remember this class where they took a couture made Balenciaga ball gown and we spent I think like an hour going over the hand rolled hem because it was a chiffon gown so there were layers and layers. I mean, I just didn't know that that kind of detail could go into something. So um, 
I felt that clothing was very similar to architecture when I went to school here. And then there's the flip side of it was just the aesthetic. Um, I remember reading something that said, you know, you think that you're making choices with your clothes, but your clothes are really making choices with you. And what it said was when you go into your, say it's raining outside and you go into your closet and you pull out your sweatpants because you just can't take it and you need to put on your sweatpants, your whole day will sort of match your mood based upon that. However, if it's raining outside and you go in and you pull out a very sophisticated outfit, your day will be elevated the way you interact and present with people will be elevated. And then every interaction that you have around that will be very different and shifted because of what you're wearing and how you present. So I just thought it was an interesting thing to keep in mind. And my favorite designer is uh, Lorenz Scott. I wanted to know how you decide who you will represent. That's a good question. Um, Truthfully, what I do is when people come in to interview me, I'm really interviewing them as well to see if they're going to be a good fit for the agency. So there's this lifestyle and entertainment footprint. We want to make sure that that works. But another thing that I'm looking for is to see if it would be a fun client. Like what I'm really looking at is, is this client going to stress out my staff and stress me out? Because at this stage of things, we don't have to work with every single person that comes to the door. Not good. We have our little rituals that we do. Um, and we don't have to work with everybody that walks to the door, which is a beautiful thing. So I'm looking for like a fit professionally and work ethic wise, but I also want to work with a nice person. I like to see how people treat my assistant when my assistant greets them at the door. Um, and I think that's something to keep in mind as well. Like just going back to my story, about when I worked at the William Morris Agency, the gentleman who hired me to go be a tour assistant, he was actually best friends with my boss. And my boss, as I mentioned, was very, very challenging. And he offered me this job because he said every time he would come in, I had it so together that he couldn't believe I even lasted that long. And it was just interesting to me to think like, you know, people are watching you and judging you even when you might not even realize. So you have to kind of be on at all times and really sort of bring your best self to every situation. I mean, I had no idea I was auditioning for this guy for as long as I was, but that's how it worked out. So yeah, how you treat other people and how other people treat us. I mean, I paid very close attention to that. Thanks. Uh, hi, Sarah. So great to see you again. I know that voice. <laughs> I appreciate the shout out. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to know, what is the best thing that you've ever learned from your biggest mistake? The best thing I ever learned from my biggest mistake? Hmm. I'm trying to think if there's been a really big mistake. <laughs> I, you know, it, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm going to think about that. But I think what I like to do, I was thinking like if there was a client that I turned away that went to go do something fantastic, but I kind of like to keep the door open. So if I change my mind, I feel I can go back. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, so I'm not into like the super hard yes, the super hard no. Um, but you know, that I learned something from every job that I've had. And that's why I would like to you know, try and share those things with you. But it's all about sort of going with the flow. And if you can, there really is a person waiting at each place to just bestow some new bit of information that may change your life, may not change your life. It's, you know, people, places, and things, always at all times, bringing you information. So, thanks. Hi. Um, it sounds like you have a really great grasp, obviously, you need to, on your own personality, the personality of others, and you're right, you have to be on all the time. Well, what are some you. tips that you have? Um, as far as bringing your best self and going after what you want? Bringing your best self and going after what you want, I think you have to really make your mind up to decide what it is you want. You know, um, I'm at a point in my life now which I feel very, very grateful for. And when I'm meeting new people and they hear like, oh, like it could be, a lot of different things, but they'll hear things like, oh, you walk to work in the morning? You're so lucky. That really isn't about luck. Actually, I don't believe in luck. I think you really have to plan 
and position yourself accordingly as you go. But when I first started my company years ago, um, we started out of the apartment. And then it just grew very organically. And at one point, my husband was like, who are all these people? And why do they all have keys to our house? Like, we've got to get an office. And he's like, well, where do you want to work? And I thought, well, one day, I don't know, I guess we'll have kids, right? I'd like to walk to and from the office so I can go back and forth for them. And there's a lot to be said for planning. So my office now is two blocks from my home. My kids come back and forth. I go back and forth. I probably see my kids a lot more frequently than a lot of other working moms do. But again, it's all about planning. So I think you should just put it out there, whatever it is that you're looking to do, and start to identify what is getting you kind of excited and, and you feel passionate about. It. Those are the things you should be leaning into. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. I just wanted to say fantastic presentation. Thank you, and Sarah. I wanted to know in regards to culture and fashion, what is your favorite city that keeps you inspired and why? Oh my gosh. Well, uh, that would be London. Thank you very much. And I know I just missed you in London when you were out there. Um, I really, really love London, and, and I'm not sure why. I have so many great experiences out there, very serendipitous, always the right thing is happening at the right time. But um, one of the things is that it reminds me a lot of New York. It has you know, the taxis, the restaurants, the museums, the theater. It's very, very much like New York. But I think travel is fantastic because, from what I understand, it works a different part of your brain. So a lot of times when you go out to travel, um, you're looking at the world with fresh eyes. And then when you come back from looking at the world with fresh eyes, usually you'll have a very big growth spurt or a very big breakthrough in some sort of a problem that you may had because your mind sort of had a chance to rest on it for a while and then experience other things. So if you're not traveling, some of the things that I've read are good to do is maybe try walking a new route to and from school, um, maybe seeing foreign films, just again, doing things that are out of the normal things, walk down a different side of the street, anything that's different to sort of tap a different side of your brain. But yes, London would be the city. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get to you. Hi, my name is Bailey, and I just want to know, while you were a student, which classes did you take that you felt were more, um, most beneficial to helping you succeed in your career? I think that's a great question. I think every class I took, even the ones that I, the majors I switched out of, were super beneficial for me because they taught me what I didn't want to do. And I think that's a really important thing for you guys. It's so much more valuable to know what you don't want to do than what you do want to do because you don't have to spend time wasting while you're just figuring like, what else am I going to do in this category that I am no longer interested in? You have to move on. Um, but even in fine arts, I learned amazing things about painting in there. And then even in ad design that I didn't end up staying in, I met incredible people. Uh, but some of the classes themselves, I think all my art classes were just fantastic. I had an eight hour sculpting class on Fridays that started at 8 a.m., which uh, was easier in the afternoon than it was in the morning. But that was probably one of my favorites. Hi, Sarah. Um, Hi, Dana. I'm wondering, uh, what was your most challenging booking? My most challenging booking? Well, I've got two, yeah, I've got two stories about that, and they both have to do with Tony. One was he skated at the Grand Palais in Paris, and it was amazing. But somehow, I was just going there to watch. I was not working on the event. I just, he invited me to watch. So, when I got there, there was some sort of a mix-up, and the hour press conference that he had with, I think, three or four journalists somehow had about 200 journalists that were demanding to speak with him, and the press person was, like, crying in French, and it was just craziness, and, and everyone was like, what are we going to do? And I had just gotten my iPhone, and I was, like, obsessed with it, and I'm like, oh, my God, here's what we're going to do. I will take out my iPhone, and we can have like a seven minute stopwatch with all different people from different parts of the world. So we ended up having this press conference in seven minute increments. And I was like, all right, send in the Italians. And then seven minutes were up, I'm like, you're out. Send in all the people from Spain. And then they were out. Send in everybody from Asia. And so it went all, we went all around the world with my iPhone uh, said in seven minute increments. 
And at one point, Tony and I were alone in this room, and I looked at him. I'm like, I'm like sweating. I'm like, oh my god, like, who are you? And he's like, whatever. I'm like, um, so that was one that was really challenging. And then another one with him, which was super challenging, was let me see if I can find that slide. When I was working with Tony early on, there were no, I mean, so he and I have been working together now over 16 years. And there were no skateboard uh, icons that we could work with. As a matter of fact, you may be interested to know that a lot of media people laughed at me when I signed him because they told me it was like signing on a professional yo-yo champion or a professional Frisbee player. But I knew that because he won every event since he was 14 years old, I told him, I said, if you played piano, you'd be a prodigy by now. The only thing missing from this equation is the exposure. And I want to be the one to do it. So no one literally was skating back then except for one person, which was Bart Simpson, who's not a real person. But it was the only person I ever saw on a skateboard. So I called the casting person. And I said, um, I think that this is a great fit. And she said something really interesting. It was Bonnie Patelia. And she said something really interesting. She said, I know who he is because I came from Southern California. So I've got brothers, and I've known who Tony Hawk is for years and years. I think this is very, very cool. But all of my writers are East Coast Ivy League graduates, and they will not get this at all. So I said to her, you know what? Let's keep the conversation open, and I am going to call you again. I said, don't worry, I'm not going to stalk you, but if it's okay with you, I'm going to call you every six months because I'm very confident that his star is on the rise. And so that's what we did. And then I want to say maybe like, so we got to be very friendly, by the way, over the next couple of years. And I want to say it took maybe five or six years. And then she called me. And she's like, Sarah Hall, I just want to let you know, I'm sitting here with your press kit on my desk. It is yellow with age, and it is curled at the corners, but we are finally going to do this story. And it was so organic at the time, because he became so famous now that the video game came out, they actually wrote an entire episode around him, instead of him just being kind of like a cameo where he played himself. They wrote a whole episode around him, and he was on the cover of TV Guide. So that was initially my most challenging, and then I want to say it went on to be like one of my shining moments. Hi, Sarah. Oh, that's... Hello. Um, I wanted to ask, who's your favorite model? Mm, my favorite model? Well, working at Ford, we weren't really... That's a funny question. Working at Ford, we weren't really allowed to have favorite models because they're kind of like, they're all your children. And I had a roster of probably like 27 models at any one point, depending on who was in town and who wasn't. And I really did love them all. They were all awesome. But I think my absolute favorite was um, a woman named Renee Simonson, who, if I could scroll back, I'll show you who she was. Um, Renee Simonson was what I would call the fairest of them all. She was just gorgeous. But you know, you can't really choose when you're working with the world's most beautiful women because it's ridiculous. They're, they're all spectacular and gorgeous. Um, where? I'll have to find her at some point. I will show you when I find Renee, but she was great. She'd be my favorite. Perfect. Hey, my name is Melissa Williams. I just relocated from Tampa, Florida. I'm a freelance fashion stylist. Hi. And I was wondering if you represent freelance fashion stylists, and if not, what qualities and experiences do they need to have for you to consider representation? Rep for representation? Mm -hmm. Um, you're certainly welcome to call us okay. and you can work with my lovely assistant here, Carolyn Joyce, okay. and schedule a time and we could talk about that. I think uh, what we ask for all of our potential new business clients is sort of where do you want to be and what is your platform? What's your message? Um, I know that for us working with Lisa Evans, the Hollywood stylist, one of her messages to us was... Um, she felt that clothing can really convey confidence in people, and she thinks that's the best thing that she can do is take, whether they're a celebrity or a regular person, take a person who might not have been confident in their clothing 
and then show them how they can find things that are the most flattering for their body type and set them out into the world kind of a new person now that they've recalibrated and they have a new sense of self-esteem. So um, think about what your message is and then by all means call Carolyn and we'll go from there. Yeah. Oh, and just a quick side note, that's Renee Simonson on the cover of Elle on the left in the turban. She was my favorite. I'm next. Um, you spoke about um, hustling on the phone, and I was wondering, what are some traits that make for a persuasive speaker? There's a lot of things, guys. There's like a lot of tips when you're making phone calls. One is that you should always be smiling on the phone because a smile can be heard on the other side of the phone. You should also be sitting up nice and tall so that you're speaking from your diaphragm and you sound confident. Um, so we have a loft at our office, and sometimes when new people come on board, they're pitching on the phone like this because they're I'm like, okay, that's creepy. You gotta stop doing that right away. And you have to just sound um, like yourself. One of the most important things, I think, is sounding very conversational. We're not selling Girl Scout cookies. We don't need to be selling anything, least of all these clients. If we're connecting with the right editor or producer, they can recognize a client that's worth their weight in gold and they will book them. So it's really just about being very conversational and letting them know this is who they are, this is what they do, and then usually the rest of it happens pretty organically. Um, I would also suggest too, if you needed to, to stand up, that gets your energy flowing from your head to your toes. And some of my more successful negotiations will be standing. Like my office, if somebody comes in to tell me something and they see that I'm standing while I'm on the phone, they're like, okay, okay. And they back away because they know like that's one of those moments where you're really like in the flow. I see. I'm sorry, it's just it's hard to see with the lights. Okay. Okay. Sarah, I wanted to know um, how you measure success for your clients, and do you have some clients who measure success in different ways or unconventional ways? Mm -hmm. um, our client, Gabrielle Bernstein, who I mentioned before, she has a book called uh, May Cause Miracles, and she has another book called um, Miracles Now. And in Miracles Now is where she says, and I want to adapt this, I measure success by how much fun I'm having. And I think that's just brilliant because I used to measure success by how much money I made or how stressed out I was. And they're just not successful measurements. Um, and I think that measuring things by how much fun you're having really forces you to make some executive decisions in terms of, okay, these clients can pay the bills, but they're killing me. Do I want this? So again, at this stage, life is too short. We're just aiming for having a really enjoy, an enjoyable time at work. And I, I'm happy to say that because I really do like what I do. And I feel that I am successful because I can't really tell sometimes the difference between work and play. And that's when I know that I'm at a successful point in my life. Hi, I was just wondering what tips could you give us about dealing with tough bosses? Because I know you said you worked with one for like seven years. So how do you think it's best to manage that situation? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a couple of different things. One is you have to really have that incentive of what is this position is this relationship, what is it going to afford me later? Like I knew that my boss was very difficult at the William Morris agency, but a friend of mine said, you should take that job just for their Christmas party. Like you will have access to so many people you would never be able to meet. You'd be remiss to not take that job. And that's a big part of the reason why I took it was for access. Um, but when you do really have a difficult boss, I, I think a good way to go is talking to them. Like just, and not in like a hysterical way and not in a blamey way, but in a like, we should go for a drink. Like, let's just go sit down and go for a drink. Um, I know when we have issues at work, you know, we have what we call family meetings. Like it's not all sunshine all the time. Sometimes things get really hard and things get really tough and we have to figure out what's the best way through this that's going to keep everybody's integrity intact. And sometimes we have these family meetings where it's like, all right, 
let's talk this out. What is going on? And how are we going to get to the other side of this? And I tell you, like, it's almost like the situation wants to be self-corrected. It is the fastest, cleanest way to clear the air and just see what that goal is and be reminded of that. So I would try the, the conversing first. Yeah. Hi. Um, so when did you start your own company and um, how did you know it was the right time to branch off on your own? Well, I had been working on the road and then wanted to come off the road, um, as I had mentioned, and I didn't ever think I was going to start my own company, but I had met a couple of different clients through agents and managers, and they said that they really wanted, they liked my level of enthusiasm, they liked my ideas, and they really wanted to work together. And I was thinking that I wouldn't be able to handle it because it was too new. And I said, well, let me see, like, maybe I can call some of the bigger agencies and I'll get hired there and you come with me. And they're like, no, we've tried those bigger agencies. We hate working with all those people. Like, you have a very fresh approach in terms of how to make um, a brand. And that's kind of when I knew that I think I could do this is because I had, you know, one or two super encouraging clients early on. And that makes all the difference when you have people tell you, you can do this when you've never scaled that mountain before. That's really helpful. Hi, um, I was wondering, do you represent fashion designers? And if yes, then at what point do you think like of a young designer's career would be a good time to start looking for PR agencies, um, professional like help? services. Mm -hmm. We have represented some people in fashion over the years. And um, I'm just going to be really straight with you in terms of what it takes for anybody to come in. PR is really expensive. It's really, really expensive. But it's less expensive than advertising. So some people don't realize, but like, you know, um, one of our clients had gotten a full page story. Actually, it was a multi-page story in something like Red Book. And her husband flipped through it, you know, we're showing it to him like on this glass case and her husband looked through it and he's like, oh, that's pretty. And I'm like, actually, it's a little more than pretty. Like you may not realize it's 99,000 and change to buy your way into a full page ad. So you do the math on that when your wife is in a story that's maybe five or seven pages long. It's really expensive to influence people. So a lot of people come to PR where the retainer might be between, say, four and eight a month or upwards of that if there are more tiers to that program. But we're going after television, magazines, newspapers, regional as well as national, radio, websites, and of course now social media, which has become you know, a very, very big thing. Hi, Sarah. Hello. I wanted to know, at what point did you know you wanted to do, be in the field of PR, and how did you know you'd be good at it? That's a funny question. I did not know that I would be good at it. You know, it's funny, is all the jobs that you've seen that I had, they seem very random, but in truth, they're really all about communications. I think they're all strung together by a very common thread. When I worked at Ford, I was dating someone who was a fashion designer and he made metal mesh clothing and I think it was Cher who saw something in a window and bought one of his first pieces and I was so excited because he used to sleep in a bathtub on Avenue B and like this like brought him into the real world where he could afford to pay his rent and I remember when I was at Ford I made phone calls for him on my lunch hour and so I didn't know that I was being a publicist at the time but I was very successful at doing it. So, you know, on my lunch hour, I got him, I think, a three-page spread in People magazine. I got him a full-page feature in Interview magazine at the time, details and a couple of other things. So it was kind of like, um, unbeknownst to me at the time, it was kind of like a side hustle in a way. So again, those are really important, I would say, at this point in your life. Like, you might have your job, but if you have a side hustle that you're really kind of like, excited about and you can't wait to get to it, that at some point you should be swapping out those two things. That 80-20 ratio should be switching where the thing that you're really excited about comes, to, comes into being. So I didn't know that I was going to get into PR, but when I look back, 
I was doing that on my lunch hour for free, by the way. Didn't even charge them. So. Hi. So I've noticed on one of your slides it says to look at clients with fresh eyes. Uh, what are some of the approaches that you take towards that process and how do you keep it relevant to your client's needs? Yeah, um, looking at a client with fresh eyes, that is very contingent upon the client. And so we like to sit down with them. We um, prepare what's called a ramp-up email for our clients and it's like two or three pages long. And we want to know every little detail about them. So if they're a parent, if they have a champagne collection, if they have a motorcycle collection, these are some of the things that our clients have had. We would never know that about them unless we're like extracting this information. And when we have enough information, we, when we're talking to the media, we can really tell who has this sort of interesting slice of life story. I don't know, I, I got into personal PR because I really like reading biographies. Those are my favorite kind of books. So even with people that I see in the media, I love the long formatted profile where you think you know this person, but then you go in and you read something and you're like, oh my God, I had no idea that they have a champagne collection in their basement. That's so exotic. That's so cool. Um, so we look to position our clients in these ways we'll, we'll, and we'll interview them and we'll find out from them, what else do you do? What kind of hobbies do you have? What kind of magazines do you read for fun? A lot of little questions can sort of bring to the forefront what this person is really like, and then we know what the media would find interesting. Hi, Sarah. Um, what are some of the pitfalls you see in brands that don't, don't have their own PR? I'm sorry, can you rephrase that for me? Yeah, like what are the mistakes that you see in brands that don't have their own PR firm or PR company? Mistakes in brands. Uh, let me think about that. We talk about that actually a lot in my office. Brands that like are doing it kind of wrong or like what's missing. Um, sometimes, I think timing has a lot to do with things. So like this might be a tangential or adjacent answer, but I think you'll know what I mean. Like there's certain times we're talking about films in, in our office and some of us are very confused as to when that movie came out. Some of us think it happened already, and some of us think it hasn't launched yet. And, and we came to the conclusion, they have been promoting that film for so stinking long, we actually don't know when it's coming out and when it is. That's an example of best efforts being used. I'm sure a ton of money was poured into it. But if you're not concise, and you kind of always have, I think in every industry, one opportunity to really launch something, if you take the roundabout way and you're too long at doing it, you'll confuse people. And they won't really know what you're selling. I'm sure you've all seen ads for things where you're not sure what in the ad is actually being sold. Sometimes it might be a little too high concept for the general good of actually selling something. I hope that helped answer it. I wish I could think of the things we talk about at work because we do talk about that frequently. Yeah, and clients should always have something new to talk about. So if something didn't work, there should be something in six months. If it's for a brand, there should be a new approach that they would like to take six months from then. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> what is your favorite part about PR and why? I have a lot of different favorite parts about PR. Um, some of it is the travel with the clients. We've got some fun stories. And... I like traveling with them um, to see them in their element and also getting the press around it. It's really rewarding to see it come together. But I think my favorite part is the new business meeting. I, there was a game when I was younger. You guys are probably too young to know, but there was a game called Mystery Date, and it was a board game. And there was like a little door, and you'd open this door, and it would be a guy, and like it might be the guy in the tuxedo, and then you open it again. It might be the guy in the motorcycle jacket. Like you never knew who you were going to get. And I always joke that that's what I feel like it is at work. It's like mystery day because somebody will make an appointment to come in and it could be like a party planner. It could be a florist. It could be an athlete. It could be, you know, uh, an author. You never know. And I just, I love meeting with all these really interesting people. Whether we work with them or not, sometimes it's just so cool to hang out with them for an hour and learn about their life. We're like, oh, so talented. So I think that's my favorite part still after all these years. That's still my favorite. 
Um, hi, Sarah. My name is Michelle, and I have a question. I know you mentioned that it's um, starting off in print media. You're able to reach people, yeah. and um, how now it's moving to more digital and with social media reaching a right, wider audience. Now, um, despite reaching that wider audience, do you find any detriments to that? And also, do you find any problems, especially with magazines? And I know that for a while that magazines were kind of going out of style, if you will. They're going out of print. They weren't being made as much. So, what are your like views on that? Yeah, thank you. Michelle, your name is? Yes. Thanks, Michelle. Um, magazines are going to be around for a while. It's going to be a well while before they're, before they're gone. I do have two issues <clears throat> to mention. One would be I'm a little concerned and have been for a while at how, how ageist the magazines have become. It's really, really frightening to me because the baby boomers, as I'm sure you've all read, are the ones that have the money and they're the ones that can spend and Madison Avenue is just turning a blind eye to them. And without naming too many names, I will just say that we had a client who was um, a Ford Classic model and she became a makeup artist afterwards and developed a line of cosmetics. And she had this lipstick that we were getting press everywhere for. And I had a conversation with somebody at Allure Magazine who said, oh, we wouldn't be able to use this. Thanks so much for, for calling about it. We wouldn't be able to use it because she's too old. And I laughed and I said, oh, no, no, you totally misheard me. I'm not pitching a story on her. I know that she's over 60. I'm pitching a story on the product. And she's like, no, I heard you. She's too old. And I really like got upset. And I said, you know, what's really interesting to me is that if we swapped out the word age, I don't know, maybe for the word color or proclivity, like there'd be at least three lawsuits on this conversation. And I don't know why we're even having this conversation. So we ended up getting two very big hits in Allure magazine <laughs> from that <laughs> phone call. But it was alarming to me because I don't know how old the person is who invented mascara. I don't care. Like, I just want to know what products are out there. And it was unnerving that she's making decisions based upon somebody's age. Um, that is weird. Another thing, there was just an article in the New York Times that you guys might have seen about uh, Twitter. And I think it was called like the assassination of Justine something or other, this girl sent out a very irresponsible tweet, and by the time her plane landed, she had lost her job, people were up in arms, and um, if you can, Google this article, and please go and read it, because it really talks about how we are in this digital age, which is wonderful because it's so advanced, and we get to see things from all over the world, and we get to react to everything. But for social media, we've in a way turned into gladiators. Everybody is tearing everybody apart. That's very disturbing. I don't think that social media should be used for that. I think um, Madonna recently falling at the Brit Awards, that had brought out the most wickedly malicious yet gleeful comments from friends of mine, let alone strangers. I was, I was horrified. And so I think that we have to be really responsible with things like social media and where we're using it to tear people down. Um, you know, somebody could kill themselves falling down steps. It's, it's a horrible thing that happened. Not to mention she actually got up and finished the entire performance, you know, with a pair of antlers in her hands, like a victorious, you know, dance that she did. She was amazing. But people have gotten incredibly judgmental because of this um, veil of anonymity that they can hide behind in their computer screen. And I think that is really irresponsible. So if you guys can check that article out, I think that you'll really appreciate it. Hello. I would like to ask you, how interesting does the job have to be? Let's say a yo-yo master, but he's really good at the yo-yo. No one else can master his yo-yo skills. Would you still be able to make him famous? <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. That's my son, Hayden. 
That's my son, Hayden, who has the soul of an agent. I think all of you can tell. That's actually a great question, Hayden. And, and I, I didn't mean to offend yo-yo champions before when I said that, because I think maybe I offended you when I said that, and I didn't mean to. But you're right. If somebody actually did a great job in something really, really outstanding in any kind of an industry, if they can stand out more than anybody else, they would have a fair shot at getting some press. And that would separate them from everybody else in that chosen field and in that category. But thank you for asking that. Hi, Sarah. Oh, this is loud. I'm, uh, my name is Sony. Hi. And hi. I'm so glad that I walked in here. I kind of walked in here randomly. <laughs> but you're an interesting person to listen to. Um, as a businesswoman and as an owner of your company, what do you do consistently every day that adds to the success of your business? Good question. Um, well, there's some things for me, and then there's some things we do for the office. Uh, for me, I try and I try and work out every morning for 30 minutes, like a hardcore Tracy Anderson dance cardio, because it keeps me very lucid and non-foggy. And then I drink hot water and lemon as soon as I get to the office. That also keeps the lucidity going. And then at work, we do a couple of things to kind of stay in our fighting shape. Um, we meditate every day at four. And we do, recently we started doing Pilates um, every Thursday at 12.30. So, you know, you kind of take these moments where you can get them to keep you in the right space so that you'll be able to stay and do what you do. I also like to tell my office I really want them to leave at 6, um, and, you know, unless there's a client in town and we have to be somewhere, but I want them to leave at 6 because I don't want anybody to get burnt out. I want everybody to go and live a very interesting life, and I want them to travel and come back with great stories about where they traveled. And I think that's the best way to keep a happy staff is to sort of let them go and enjoy and see the world, and then they can come back and you know work hard while they're there, but then go home. Yeah, I meet a lot of people who say um, they're at the office until 10 o'clock or later, and I just don't understand how you can really function doing one thing all the time. You really have to kind of sharpen the saw at some point and like step back. Sarah, we have two more questions. Okay. Hi, Sarah. Obviously, SHP and your wonderful family keep you very busy. I was wondering if in your free time, who or what are your current muses? Mm, my current muses. Well, I think um, musically, Sky Fiera. I just, I love her stuff, and she's so um, unapologetic about everything that she does. I really, really like her stuff. And um, I mean, this might sound a little cliche, but Instagram, I'm really, really loving Instagram because I feel like you could just go all over the world with it and find the most fascinating people and follow them. I also think it's kind of like what Malcolm Gladwell talks about, about thin slicing. You can tell a lot about a person by their feed and um, I'm enjoying that also, sort of looking in and seeing if people are colorful or if they're kind of dark and somber and maybe they're a mix of everything. So, yeah, for right now, I think musically it would be Sky and day-to-day, um, -day, probably Instagram. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Over here in the back. Right hi. here. Oh, hi. <laughs> How are you? Oh, good. Uh, thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. And my name is Corral. And I was hi. wondering, um, I was seen in uh, one of your slides. Um, I saw uh, Gabriel, Gabriel Bernstein as well as Mastin Kip. Yeah. So I was wondering, is there a focus that you have on the spiritual realm or self-care that's very dear to you, considering that you also mentioned that you're doing now, like all these wonderful you know, things to recharge at the office and to start the day? That's yeah. one question. Okay. And then the other thing is, I was wondering if you have actually been the one reaching out to a client that you really want to work with. All right, I'll answer that one first. I, I don't often. Um, I think early on I did, but then things kind of took off quickly, so I don't have that opportunity as much. But my first client that I ever pursued was Barbara Butler, who built the play structures. And um, I had read about her, and so I called their 
all the time. And I would get, I didn't know this at the time, but it's her sister who works with her. And her sister was kind of tough with me on the phone. And she's like, I do the press. I do this. And I'm like, okay. Um, but I said, if it's okay with you, I'm going to keep calling and checking in. I'm keep sending you stuff. And so for like six months, I sent over like these materials, these long handwritten letters. And then I called over and Barbara answered the phone. And I actually got really nervous. Like my knees were like buckling. And um, I'm like, this is Sarah Hall and I really want to work with you. And, and Barbara was like, oh my gosh, Sarah Hall. She'll be talking about you all the time. I'm like, let's just do this. <laughs> and I hung up thinking, is it that easy to sign a client? Like just get them on the phone <laughs> and have them say, let's do this. Um, so that's what that's how Barbara Butler came to be. So I should be pursuing people more often because it was easy the very first time I did it. I should try it again. Um, the second question is, we didn't intentionally set out to work with Gabrielle Bernstein and Mastin Kip, but those are books that I probably go by on my, on my own. And I did say earlier, I do believe that your thoughts create your reality. And I think that if you are coming from this, like, you know, you're a magnet. I feel that you take one step towards the universe and the universe takes three steps towards you. So in a way, it was only a matter of time before Gabby and Mastin and everybody else from Hay House found themselves as Hay House jokes with us that we um, represent the spiritual mafia, that we have like all the spiritual clients. <laughs> So we're not doing it intentionally, and we have plenty of other publishing houses that we work with that are non-spiritual. But um, I'm so glad that they're there. We learn so much from them. These are probably the nicest people in the world. And Gabby has a great thing that she taught me for my other clients, because Gabby reads a lot of very negative stuff about her, which I would think is actually impossible. But on the internet, where people have this fake veil of anonymity, People have written very mean things about her, and she said in the beginning it used to really throw her off her game and upset her, and then she meditated on it, and she realizes that really all you need to do is forgive and delete, and that's it. Forgive and delete, and it all goes away like that. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. That What a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for coming to FIT. And as a reminder, we have a fabulous event for you downstairs. So if there's some of you are too scared to ask your question, you can always maybe catch her on the side there. But thanks again, Sarah. It was Thank really you. a pleasure. Thank you guys. You're great.